On this episode of The Resilient Advisor, I have the opportunity to interview Jason Sue, who is the Chief Investment Officer at Raylian. We spend 20 minutes talking about the investment thesis for China, but I had some audio difficulties that traditionally I might not launch the broadcast, but I think that the content in this episode is fantastic for advisors who have not yet uncovered the opportunity that there are in China. So I apologize for the audio quality on my end. I hope you enjoy this interview with Jason. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Resilient Advisor Show. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me today is Jason Sue of Raylant Global Advisors. And we're going to talk about the investment thesis in China. Jason, thank you for joining us on the Resilient Advisor Show. This is your first time on the broadcast. For any of your audience that's tuning in for the first time, know that if you want to ask Jason a question, please simply type a comment on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, and I'll be able to pose it to Jason during the broadcast. Let's start with this, Jason. Tell listeners and viewers a little bit about you and your firm. All right. Well, thanks, Jay, for having me on the show. A little bit about Raylian. Uh, we actually spun out of a larger organization that some of the advisors may be more familiar with. We came out of research affiliates uh, and it was about 2016. I decided to pivot from doing fundamental indexing to China. And really, it was a, a comment made by my mentor and good friend, Rob Arnott, who said, you know, to have success in your career, you got to go to where the puck will be, not where the puck is. And of course, for a big part of my career, the puck has been U.S. large cap. Uh, but I think it's probably a good bet that over the next few decades, the puck will be uh, where China is today. And so this is all we do is 100%. Uh, everyone on the team skin in the game, uh, trying to bring China beta and China alpha to the rest of the investment world. Awesome. And that's why I was excited to have you on the show. And frankly, Jason, I hope we can turn this into a series because I agree with you. There is an opportunity in the emerging markets, particularly China for investors. And I don't feel most US-based financial advisors fully appreciate that opportunity. So let's start our question set with that. Could you please contrast the opportunity in emerging markets in China and what we have here in the US today? Uh, absolutely. If you think about uh, you know, China and US, US and increasingly, um, you know, we see you know, China as sort of that rising superpower competing uh, for for spotlight, now, some of us might want to think of this as the sort of U.S. Russia competition with two superpowers, and and that can get uncomfortable, right? That that bring us back to the Cold War. But I think the better analogy is really think of it as you know, the rise of Japan, and you know during the you know early '80s, uh, much of the 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 '90s, um, that's actually brought greater prosperity as two super economic power. Uh, go into a competition, right? Collaborating on trade on many fronts. Uh, it was more business for everyone, but also there's obviously competition as some of those businesses got into the same sector, like automotive and like electronics. Uh, and so I very much like to think of this as uh, a redux of that. Uh, you know, the rise of China is going to give us a uncorrelated source of growth that we probably more recently probably uh, would not be able to uh, get access to easily. And this increased access and this uncorrelated source of growth is just good news for, for everyone's portfolio. So let's talk about that uncorrelated source of growth. And I like that terminology. So if you're a U.S.-based financial advisor, you're building portfolios and say you buy into the thesis that you need more exposure to China. How do you think advisors who are starting the process of looking at that allocation should look to capture that return? Well, first of all, a lot of advisors do have some China in their portfolio. Now, most advisors have an EM product in their portfolio, and they probably have been a little disappointed by their EM performance, right? We, we all know EM is supposed to grow faster. And in fact, the last 15 years, EM has grown about, uh, you know, four and a half percent real, you know, versus US at 2% real. But that hasn't translated into stock market performance. And that's because in emerging markets, Corporate earnings growth has actually only grown at about 2% nominal, right? That's, no, that's actually significantly lower 
than U.S. corporate earnings growth. Now, if you take China out of EM, and China is really a long outlier here, in the, in the last 15 years, uh, China GDP has grown at 9.5% real, and its corporate earnings growth has grown closer to 15% nominal. Uh, so why is China this, this outlier? That's because you really have two parts of EM, right? You have the cyclical commodities play. So think of Brazil, think of Russia. So there's no trend line growth. There's just sort of cycles after cycles where you get some diversification from those fluctuations, but you really don't get to buy growth. And what you have with China is much more of this emergence of a young population going from unskilled to skilled household, going from quite poor to saving a lot, generating a lot of income and consuming a lot. And this is really the opportunity uh, for investors to, to, to take account of, which is, yes, you have some China in your EM, but it's, it's likely that uh, it's a underexposure still because, you know, the rest of the EM really doesn't uh, give you the kind of growth that you're hoping to buy with uh, getting exposure to emerging markets. So oftentimes, uh, you know, we're speaking with advisors and, and our suggestion is if you really want to buy growth, um, perhaps, you know, carving out a separate allocation to China. Uh, makes sense. So don't think of you already have some China in your EM uh, because uh, you know, a China carve out actually is going to give you a lot more access to growth than just accessing it through EM. Okay. So a separate allocation to China. How do you suggest advisors allocate to that? And let's use the answer to this question as an education opportunity. Could you tell us a little bit more about onshore and A shares investing in China versus an ETF that would give them some exposure? It's domiciled in the U.S. Got it. Uh, so I think there are two dimensions you want to look at the access question. One is onshore versus offshore, and the other one is active versus passive. So let me start with the you know, onshore versus offshore. Uh, so another nomenclature that's been thrown around by major index providers is China A shares versus the uh, H and the ADR. So the H and the ADR are often referred to as the offshore China and the A, the onshore. Uh, so let me start with the offshore. Um, by and large, if you bought a China ETF listed in the US, and if that product has had a long track record, it's most likely that it's primarily the H shares because the H shares have been available for access for the longest time. Right? It's listed in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a very international market. And of course, the ADRs, right? That's actually grown larger and larger over time as well. So the easy access is what people have historically bought. Are they China enough to, for you to say, well, I don't need to deal with the, the onshore stuff that has slightly harder access. So let me tell you about the H shares. The H shares for historical reasons have been almost exclusively state-owned enterprises. That's because Hong Kong for a long time was a gateway to China and was face of China. So only the biggest state-owned monsters were allowed to list in Hong Kong projecting a, you know, a, a facade of strength and size. So these are, Companies that on first day of listing is already four hundred billion dollars in market cap. They're the biggest state-owned monopolies. So if you buy the H share, you're really not buying the interesting part of China. You're not buying growth. You're just buying a lot of state-owned enterprises. Now, what about the U.S. ADRs? Right? You think of ah Alibaba, right? That's a very interesting ADR that's done well since listing. But that's actually the outlier, not the norm. In fact, what's normal for the ADRs are actually firms that don't have a good enough balance sheet income statement to gain listing onshore in China or in Hong Kong. And what a lot of advisors don't realize is the U.S. stock exchanges have significantly lower listing requirements versus Hong Kong and China. And it's because the U.S. is much more of a buyer beware. Right? You know, there's just a very minimum listing threshold. And if someone wants to buy your stock, it's, it's consenting adults making deals. So they don't get too involved. And so oftentimes you have a lot of low quality Chinese companies listing in the U.S. And that's why we, we tend to see a lot more of sort of these fraudulent actors who would switch after listing blow up. And then we have many of examples. And that's actually much more unique to the U.S. ADRs because of the listing uh, standard requirements. So the onshore is really where there are a lot more stocks representing a lot more different industries, names that you've never heard of, but they're names that could possibly grow up into your next Tencent, your next Alibaba, uh, and uh, by and large, um, because it is a, a more retail-oriented market, it's also where larger is larger, uh, alpha is larger, which then takes us into my uh, sort of next dimension for analysis, which is passive versus active. Once you recognize that, uh, you know, China Asia is 85% retail traded, it means uh, it's a large reservoir for alpha, right? The chance that the other side of your trade is retail is very, very high. 
And this is why you want to use an active approach versus passive. Jason, I'd like to go a little deeper on that. Could we go back for a second for some clarification? Because I'm sure for most of my audience, you know, you just you laid out some information that's new to them. And I think if you're exploring investing in China, this is very important. So let, let me clarify my understanding. So whether you're looking at an ADR or an H share, uh, you're not necessarily getting the China growth story that you would get versus looking at an A share onshore. Is that correct? That is correct. Excellent. Now, can U.S. investors and portfolio managers access A shares in the form of, uh, or how would they access A shares here in the United States? Is probably the better question. Yeah, Jay, it used to be quite difficult. You have to get approved for what's called QFI quota, but that's that's been changed uh, since a few years ago. So now access is quite simple. Uh, most managers, investors could buy directly if they set up an account with a Connect approved <clears throat> uh, custodian bank. Uh, so you know a lot of ETFs now are starting to make it available. So pure A shares access, and I think for advisors who are looking for more uh, pure China access and more growth oriented China access. Uh, a, a shares product is where they should look. Got it. And then uh, you were about to go into the active versus the passive investing as it relates to China A shares. Put some context and color on that for us and how you would recommend financial advisors approach that. Absolutely. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, once you made up your mind that, hey, you know, getting access to China or getting additional access to China makes sense to A shares, um, the most interesting feature about the A shares market is that. 85% to 95% of you know the trading volume on any given day is conducted by retail individuals. So not you know not your professional hedge funds, not your you know investment bank prop desk. Uh, so the chance that the other side of your trade is actually someone who's not very informed, not very skilled, and is likely to lose from that trade is quite high. Right. So that's the good news, right? Otherwise, in the U.S., we know it's a very institutional market. It's hard for anyone to consistently make alpha because the other side is equally intelligent and perhaps even more intelligent. Uh, so in China, the possibility for alpha is 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 high and it's credible. Uh, and because the other side tends to be retail individuals, uh, they tend to suffer from all of the things we teach in textbook about behavioral biases. Right. They, they, they have mental accounting that's not quite correct. They have loss aversion. They don't want to sell their losers. They sell their winners way too early. They react to news that everyone already know about, uh, thinking that it's somehow unique private information. Uh, so a behavioral finance approach tends to be significantly more successful in that market. Uh, and so certainly any sort of active strategy that targets specifically the behavioral alphas in the markets are likely to be more reliable. And, and more consistent in sale for production. Yeah, I bet the FOMO dynamic is very real over there, which can lead to bubbles, which takes me to my next question. I mean, last year was a great year for Chinese stocks. That, was it a bubble? Was it driven by behavioral biases like FOMO? Well, I think the best way to see if a market, a bull market is uh, driven by uh, sort of optimism, irrational optimism or fundamentals is to look at uh, whether valuation multiples uh, have exp have blown out or whether the uh, corporate earnings growth have, have just grown faster than expected. And very much, at least the last one year in China, it's been uh, a bubble, right? It's really the growth oriented stocks, the very expensive stocks becoming more expensive. Uh, last year in China, uh, growth outperformed value by about 35%. Uh, and, and that's just not normal in, in any market under any circumstances. 1999 USA. <laughs> oh gosh. So you feel that there is a bit of a bubble in the A shares in China. Well, so it's really a tale of uh, two styles. Uh, if you look at the median stock, right, you just look at you know what's in the benchmark index, uh, the valuation multiple is actually at median. So it doesn't look expensive if you just look at the average stock. Uh, where there's a lot of froth is really in the growth oriented uh, technology company. So not different to the US, right? You know, China has its own version of Tesla in Neo, right? It went from a near bankrupt company trading at, you know, uh, penny stock prices to now a, you know, $100 billion company still near bankruptcy and still losing, you know, 100,000 for every car they sell. So that's where things are expensive. Uh, and you also have a lot of the value quality names, a lot of very high quality banks, a lot of very high quality consumer plays that are trading at sort of record cheap multiples. So 
yes, the broad market is sort of fairly priced, you know, which is the better news in the US, right? In the US, S&P is, is, you know, the broad average is actually uh, expensive at two-year deviation versus norm. Uh, but in China, really, the, um, the, the value stocks are, are at historical cheapness and absolute and, and relative levels. Okay. So I cannot believe we're already 15 minutes into this, and I've got a whole sheet of questions here, so I want to be judicious. Uh, let's talk about accounting standards in China, because the only way to really understand valuations is to have faith in the accounting that's used at the balance sheet and income statement level. So could you just address U.S. investor and advisor concerns about the accounting standards in China versus the U.S.? All right. So there is no uh, no way to, to sort of make it sound better. So I'm just going to be blunt. Uh, the accounting practice in China, uh, as everyone suspected, uh, is fraught with manipulation. Right. So if you look at the data, uh, you, you you realize there's sort of abnormal abnormal number of firms that report only positive earnings. Right. Those who lose money are very very uh, far and few in between. Clearly not normal. But if you simply look no further, you would say, well, I, I have no confidence I can't invest in China. Now, if you look deeper, what you realize is actually the overwhelming majority of that manipulation is manipulating the numbers downward. Well, that's really weird, right? Why would you manipulate accounting if you're going to make the numbers look less attractive, right? Usually you manipulate numbers upward to get a higher stock price. And this actually has to do with uh, what I, you know, term a very paternalistic uh, regulatory uh, body. Uh, so the, the stock exchange in China believes it's their job to make sure only good companies uh, list. And good company means companies that don't lose money. And so they actually have rules in place where if you lose money one year, they'll come and slap you in the face. You know, If you lose money twice, you'll get sanctioned. So all sorts of sanctions are imposed on you. And if you lose money for a third year in a row, you're you know, being being prepared for delisting. And so as a result, so, you know, firms are terrified of losing money. And so what they do is if they absolutely have to report a loss, they report an enormously large loss to build a reserve so they can smooth out next year. And they have very strong earnings, they'll report less of it, again, storing it for future smoothing. And this is not sort of poor ethics on the part of management. It's really a regulatory rule that perhaps is a little, you know, too interventionist and not particularly thoughtful, that's cost uh, listed companies to, to have to play the game a certain way. I imagine if you have Tesla in China, that would have been delisted four times over. <laughs> oh, man, I really enjoyed that take. And I actually I have a deeper understanding now of the dynamics on the accounting challenges. And I know that is one of the first things advisors bring up to me when we're talking about their portfolio construction. Uh, Another aspect that I think U.S.-based financial advisors struggle with when it comes to allocating to China is if they or their client base have a bias towards ESG type investing, where they're looking for companies that have some type of governor on what they are doing, you know, from an environmental or social standpoint. And it's really hard to figure out what's going on in China. What are your thoughts as far as what advisors should be looking at as it relates to an ESG lens in China? Absolutely. Uh, when applying ESG lens, uh, you know, not only does it reflect our, our value systems, um, oftentimes it can be return enhancing. So in China, what's in particularly important is to focus on governance. Uh, this is a, a aspect of, of the company that's very undervalued in China. So if you separate firms into those that have strong governance, they have the right board structure, um, they have you know, great auditing practices, uh, you know, there's not a zero sum between the insiders and the external shareholders. Uh, those firms perform significantly better over time. So governance is huge in terms of just, you know, something you care about and something that that really um, uh, helps with the performance. Um, you know, other aspects, I think you, you just have to take a slightly different attitude. When we think about ESG, you can think about level, right? And by level, you know, Japan and U.S. have firms that have generally, you know, good ESG compliance and, you know, Europe. You know, just just a head and shoulder above everyone else. But if you want to talk about sort of slope, meaning improvement, uh, China is actually a, a, a world class citizen in terms of trying to get better. Right. You don't expect them today to be very green. Right. They're, they're emerging. They're they're they, they're slightly behind in terms of putting in place technology and policies. But in terms of sort of improving where they are, 
uh, they, they probably have been one of the better countries and many of the firms have done more. And that's because uh, ultimately um, everyone does care about, you know, higher quality air, higher quality water, policymakers, consumers, and those become pressure to encourage firms to make changes. So China's not where we want it to be today. But if you look at the improvement, many of the firms are actually quite good. Excellent. Jason, our time is up. I really appreciate you coming on. This has been very informative for me personally. Tell me, where could viewers and listeners learn more about your company? Well, please do come to our website. So our website is just www.raylian, R-A-Y-L-I-A-N-T.com. And from there, there'll be links to a lot of our research articles. There'll be linked to our social media and, and where I, I and my colleagues will regularly post, hopefully, things that will be of interest and educational to you. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming on, Jason. Thank you, Jay.